academic study of religion in Asia, argument jointly with Aki Sander, 2016. Apart from this, she has to her credit many renowned publications and having many PhD scholars to her credit. In addition to excellency and discharging uh, as a teacher, she is having much association with many philosophical and competitive religion oriented national international uh, professional bodies. So, and I'm happy to share with you that by this month, we are uh, actually, Madam is going to leave us by attending a super animation 31st of this August, of this month. And uh, that is part of our uh, humble submission to pay honor to Madam. I request her, ma'am, this month you will going to officially depart us, but from code of heart, we will not depart you and you will not depart us or leave us. That's why by a courtesy, by a submission, and today, as you know, is the Raksha Bandhan days, India and nationwide, we are observing this Raksha Bandhan. So we like to have ma'am as our teacher forever, and I am sure that she will be here in Santini Ketan with, his, with her good health, and we will get every time her guide, and uh, as mentor to our future path working in person and disability as a whole. With these few words, let me hand over the floor to our Honorable Madam Asa Mukherjee to take the floor and start his uh, start our deliberation on the topic Gandhi's Vaishnava Vedanto and concern for the other. So, Madam, with these few words, welcome you all. Please, uh, session is now yours. Thank you very much, Madam. Please. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Nimai Chandra Shaha, the librarian of the Central Library. Thank you also for such a generous introduction and also providing me the opportunity to speak to the audience here on the topic Gandhi's Vaishnav Vedanta and concern for the other. Today being Raksha Bandhan, Rakhi is a kind of occasion when we extend our greetings and uh, brotherhood to all the people of the country and uh, and uh, all the brothers and sisters, they sort of uh, 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 wish each other the best of uh, everything and also also the prosperity. So, with this occasion, I want to greet each one of you uh, as a as a as by greeting from the heart. Uh, today, we are going to talk about Gandhi's Vaishnav Vedanta and concern for the other. Uh, can, I, can I have this? Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. So, um, well, uh, what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about, two questions. Is it easy? Please control it. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, basically about Gandhi's views on religion. And uh, Most of the time, we talk about Gandhi as a political leader, Gandhi as a as a as a practitioner, and also as a freedom fighter. But we often forget his inter, or we often do not really look into the foundations of his religious thought, which was part of his life. And actually, his part was his his life was nothing but religious. So in that sense, uh, I mean, I'm trying to uh, to go deep into the his, his ideas and his, his life which he lived uh, with so much passion, and the ideas and. So, there's a lot of disturbance coming. The 
illuminating idea that was central to his philosophy and its discourse. He rejected the anthropological fantasy of Western philosophy, Western modernity, which puts men at the center. He criticized Western ideas by saying that they were more anthropocentric. And on the basis of that, the Western modernity has been built. He puts men at the center. Uh, that puts men in the center. Gandhi saw enhancement in truth and heard the voice of the truth as an inner voice. Now, this is extremely important from his perspective because for him, the truth, the voice of the truth was inner voice, and that's what he was always guided by. The important point is that he heard a voice other than men. He like some others. He was like some uh, uh, like some others. He believed in a world larger than human reality. So the human reality is not really dependent on human beings, but reality is much larger than human beings. That's what he strongly believed. And therefore, he rejected the anthropocentric view of the West. Gandhi had faith in human dignity, but distrusted collective mass movement, putting greater faith in individuality or subjective choices. Uh, we know that Gandhi was a mass leader, but for him, this uh, collectivity, the mass movement, they he, he never trusted them because there was an uncertainty involved in it. But then he had a very, very strong faith in human dignity and a much greater faith in individuality and the subject, uh, subjective choices. On the matter of God and religion too, Gandhi on the occasions preferred to go by an impulse or an instinct rather than plausible scientific analysis. So he really... I mean, the scientific analysis he did respect, but scientific explanations were not really, analysis were not really enough. He would rather go by his impulses and the inner voice as we were talking about. So we all are familiar that in 1934, he attributed the Bihar earthquake and the massive loss of life and property that it caused to vengeance inflicted by God on men for the sins of untouchability which is rather hard, hard to accept. Now, as, as one cannot really accept that this earthquake was, I mean, there, definitely there's a scientific reason. So although the science, scientific analysis of earthquake was to a certain extent accept, as, uh, uh, to a certain extent acceptable to him, but for him, it was not simply a scientific reason but it was a massive loss of life which led uh, and also to the property. And that was a kind of vengeance inflicted by God on man. And this explanation is really hard to accept that this is what he thought. He thought it because of the sins of untouchability which are built in the structure, uh, Indian structure. That is why we had this uh, article. Now in this brief presentation, I will try to specifically draw upon some points about Gandhi as spiritual thinker. I do so for two fundamental reasons. For one, I believe that in colonial India, spirituality and religion represented as consistently important medium of self-understanding and self-representation among Indians. Uh, as we know, in colon colonial India, uh, things were extremely difficult uh, and modernity and the colonial influence was so uh, so much kind of uh, affecting the life of the people that understand self-understanding and self-representation was extremely important. It was a kind of challenge for Indians. Much of the Hindu cultural renaissance and the intellectual reawakening of the 19th century, the values that Gandhi deeply imbibed, actually rests more on the separation of good religion from the bad religion and not as the secular from the religious. Very often people think that the westernization really started the process of secular uh, secularism in India, but that may not be true. Basically, this reformist movement can be also be seen as uh, differentiating between a good religion and a bad religion. And Gandhi played a very important role in this process. For much of the 19th century, 
the religious consciousness was the Hindu self-understanding. I am of the opinion that not much attention has been paid towards understanding Gandhi as a religious thinker, far less so as the comparative framework. So, I mean, to understand Gandhi as a religious thinker is an attempt here. That's what I'm trying to make. And uh, his 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 framework, which is the, his religious framework, which was also not really bound by any one of the uh, the kind of Indian philosophical systems. And there's a lot one can study as a comparative framework of different Indian philosophical systems. My first submission here is that Gandhi is basically operated within the philosophical school of Vedanta, as was true of most Hindi th Hindu thinkers since the days of Ram Mohan Roy. However, this Vedanta, this Vedanta, as it occurs to me, was a unique blend of philosophical abstraction and emotive theism. Now, this is also very important to note that his Vedanta, I call it is his Vedanta, it's not Shankara Vedanta, his Vedanta, as it occurs to me, was a unique blend of philosophical abstraction and emotive theism. Now, why I say emotive, I'll come to that little later. In a sense, it sought to reconstruct a Maya Vada of Shankara. Now, we all are familiar with the, the Shankara Vedanta, where we have this Maya and Brahma, Jagat Vidya, Brahma Sat, or Brahma Sattva Jagat Vidya, where this Jagat this world is extremely uh, uh, is called mitya. Why is it called mitya? Because only Brahma is true. Uh, truth is Brahma. But they're more morally responsible. But this uh, uh, Gandhi uh, sort of uh, accepts the uh, Shankara as some part as a, as far as the uh, uh, epistemology goes. But then he reinterprets this Maya Vat of Shankara. Now, why is it called Maya? Is it really false? Shankara says it's false. But most of the reformists of Hindu tradition, they do not accept this world as Maya. And this world has a very important role to play in the life of the people. That has been the emphasis of the most of the reformists. Now, Gandhi too tries to establish this, that this Maya Vada of Shankara has to be re reinterpreted with more morally responsible and world affirming religion and philosophy. Now, how he does it as morally responsible, that's what we are going to see here. A transcendental God was never fully negated by Gandhi. Just as Shankara is talking about Brahman and he's talking about God, God who is uh, the, the, the transcendental God, Gandhi never fully negates it, but he made God more imminent and personal. Now, here the whole difference lies between his Vedanta and, Gandhi Vedanta and, and Shankara's Vedanta. The Bhagavad Gita's emphasis, we all know Gandhi it, it, it wrote a very big commentary on, on Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita's emphasis on selfless service was a prime source of inspiration for Gandhi. Gandhi told, to quote, when doubts haunt me, when disappointments cheer me, in the face, uh, sorry, for, uh, for when disappointments stare me in the face and I see not one ray of hope on the horizon, I turn to Bhagavad Gita and find a verse to comfort me. And I immediately begin to smile in the midst of overwhelming sorrow. Those who meet, meditate on the Gita will derive fresh joy, new meaning from it every day. Now, this is the kind of individual. Uh, 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 realization of uh, the God he's talking about, the personal God. Gandhi appears to have afflicted himself with a body of thought that for the lack of a better term may be called as Vaishnava Vedanta. So this is what I'm calling as Vaishnava Vedanta in case of Gandhi. And as you're all familiar, we talk about that a little later, his famous bhajan, Vaishnava Vijanuku Dene Kahi Ke Peer Parai Janere. Why Ishwar created the world? If 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 Ishwara or God is perfect, why does he have to need to create a world? The answer in Shankar Karika is Maya and Leela both. In Shankar Karika, we find both uh, Maya and Leela to be pure play of the God, or it is for Maya, the creation. 
for some purpose. Now, if we say that there is some purpose for which Ishra has created the world, then there would be duality, the world that is created and the world, and there is a creator who wanted to create the world for some purpose. And if the need in creator has to be accepted, then God would be considered to be imperfect. Because if there's a purpose for something which he's doing, then he's not perfect. Therefore, the purpose has to be negated. The God has to be perfect. To avoid this contradiction, much easier alternative is to say that it is for Leela, for his play, that there's no purpose, it's just for the enjoyment, some kind of ananda that God uh, sort of uh, creates the world. It is simply a Leela, where the intention is there, but without any purpose, for pure aesthetic enjoyment. This adds aesthetic dimension to the action in the world, and that, and also at the level of Ishvara. Gandhi's bhakti as love, as, as you know, Gandhi talks about bhakti, and in Vaishnavism, bhakti is the basic prime concern on the basis of which we develop the whole system. So bhakti as love for impersonal and transcendental God with his sensual and his world, this worldly imminence is also for his emotive bhakti. So it's not simply a bhakti, but also it's a kind of emotive bhakti which Gandhi is talking about upon what otherwise appears to be dense philosophical abstraction. Now, if we look at rationalism as a philosophy, then of course we find it as a, a philosophical abstraction. But in Gandhi, it becomes very, very simple. And it, becomes, it is a kind of emotional bhakti, emotive bhakti, which he is talking about. We'll take some examples later in this talk, and we'll see how this emotive bhakti he, he works with. Gandhi attempts at humanizing God as against the tendency to divine man. So instead, I mean, see, uh, 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 this, uh, this could be two ways. Either the God is humanized or the human is, human is, uh, uh, is, is divinized. Now, Gandhi actually accepts the first alternative, and he attempts to work on this, that he wants to humanize God, because most of the uh, system uh, of religion or religious traditions we find, for example, Rama in Hinduism, Krishna in Hinduism, Christ in, uh, in, in, in Christianity, uh, and Muhammad in Islam. So they have been humans in, in some sense, and uh, the God was humanized in, in, in such persons. But here, uh, in exactly the same way, Gandhi is trying to attempt as humanizing God as against the tendency to divinize men, monistic, dualistic Vedanta. So it is not simply monistic Vedanta, it is talking about dualistic Vedanta. It is not Advaita Vedanta, it is Dvaita Advaita. So, uh, however, in this reading of Vedanta itself, Gandhi reveals interesting differences. I would venture to argue that Gandhi chose to emphasize on love and sympathy, leaning more on Vaishnava deity and on, on its humanistic appeal. This brings out more sharply his personality as a philosopher and as an active uh, activist, respectively. So he's a philosopher as well as, as he's, a, a, he's an activist. Surely, I mean, he is a, a great a political leader as well. Gandhi asserted that the text most representative of Hinduism was Ishopanishad, which spoke of God as pervading the entire universe and yet standing outside. And yet, the very foundation of this, his moral, religious, and political thought clearly rested on Gita, a text on which he was also to comment quite recently. At the same time, it is interesting to note that Gandhi consistently defined himself both as a Hindu and a Sanatan. Now, Sanatan was a word which was used for something uninterrupted in the time and space, which continues. Sanatana. It consists use, uh, it's consistent use by Gandhi suggests his willingness to postulate an unchanging and extremely present core underlying Hindu thought and practice. So Sanatan is which that that which continues to the year uh, to the time and space. And therefore, that is something which is the core underlying uh, Hindu thought and practice. There were several occasions when Gandhi attempted to define Hindu thought. So he wanted to define 
Hindu thought and practice. But as you know, Hinduism is the name of the kind of practices, uh, 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 but it, 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 it's, a, it's a construct. It's not really a religion in that sense. In a rather formulaic way, listing characteristic qualities, which in his opinion define the Hindu and Hinduism. If anything, this makes complex matters look uh, terrifyingly simple. Uh, beside Gandhi's self-description as a Hindu, he often said that he was a Hindu, does not historically support the idea of his also being a Sanatan, Sanatanist. Now, this, there are a lot of complexities here. I'm not going to go into the complexities as some, uh, being a Sanatanist and also as a Hindu. Uh, but then... It really a Hindu doesn't. I mean, he 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 called, often called himself as a Hindu, uh, and at some point he also wanted to, himself to be a Sanatanist, but he was not Sanatanist, Sanatanist in the strict sense of the Sanat. Understandably, the Hindu Gandhi included cow production and abstinence uh, from beef eating as a defining feature of Hinduism. On the other hand, to suggest that such belief or practice go back to the formative years of Hindu religion and culture is clearly unhistorical. Cow slaughter, as is only, is only too well known, was a part of Vedic religious culture, as was the partaking of beef. What further complicates matters is Gandhi's use of the term Sanatanist in a very different phase. Though generally interpreting this term to mean the eternal values attributed to Hinduism. So basically, Sanatis means that the eternal values that those, those will continue and they are attributed to Hinduism. There is at least one instance of his using it in a pejorative sense, taking it to the represent irrational orthodoxy as is born out in colonial Indian history. Majority of Hindus in modern India are Vaishnava. This is really interesting to note. Uh, uh, they draw a part, even I am a Vaishnava in that sense, they draw a part of their inspiration from Vedas, the Upanishads, the Gita, and the Vedanta, Vedanta Sutra. But they do not accept the interpretation of these scriptures as given by the great Vedantinist Shankara, who upheld Brahmin as Nirvana. Now here the whole difference lies. Shankara took, uh, uh, Shankara, uh, 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 emphasized that Brahman is Nirguna. But Vaishnavas uh, think that Brahman is Savguna. The four great teachers of Vaishnavism, Ramanuja, Nimbark, Madhava, and Vallava, tried to refute Shankara's interpretation of God. The main contention of Vaishnavas is that liberation could be obtained only by the mercy of God through devotion and self surrender So bhakti is an extremely important point. Uh, extremely uh, uh, important uh, path and also self-surrender. Vaishnava comes from Vishnu as God, the eternal relation with the Jivatmas, individual living body, bodies and the eternally self-existing, uh, self-luminous, all-pervading Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. Gaudiya Vaishnavas are those who follow teaching of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Shri Krishna as Lord Gorango. Gandhi accepted the Vedic metaphysical view. The ultimate reality, Brahman, can be experienced as Satchidananda. On the compound Satchit, Satch plus Chit plus Anandu, or as Satyam Shivam Sundram, commonly known to traditional Hinduism and representing the fact truth, auspiciousness, and bliss, Gandhi appears. To have most readily accepted the elements of Sat and sat, as Satyam, uh, sat, uh, Satyam. This suggests that this primary concern within religions was moral and epistemic. So you, one can see that Sat and Chit and Ananda. So he emphasized more on Sat and Chit. Uh, and uh, this suggests that his primary concern within religion was moral and epistemological because he's accepting Sat as the reality. Truth, the true self, Atman is the same as Brahman. Atman is the same as Brahman, 
but gandhi's notion of satchidananda differed from traditional vedanta as it meant truth knowledge and bliss by the 1920s as we know 20s we know gandhi had turned around the difference between the word of uh, uh, turn around the expression god is truth to truth is god now this turn uh, is very interesting i wouldn't really have time to go into it god is truth to truth is god so earlier it was god is truth and later on he cut, he turned around and said that truth is god gandhi saw no difference between the word of god and the world that he had created god and his creation they are the same there's no difference they are identical in this view nature itself was the highest scripture revealed to man so whatever we see in the world of nature that itself is the highest scripture that is revealed to man by god god is life truth and light he is love for gandhi love was an essential part of atman he is the supreme god but he is no god who mere, merely satisfies the intellect if he overdoes god to be god must rule the heart and transform it now ruling the heart is extremely important here for gandhi and this is something which actually uh, comes from the concept of love uh, god must rule the heart and transform it to be nearer to god i need to try to be purer to me god is truth and love god is ethics and morality god is fearlessness god is the source of life and life and and life and yet he is above and beyond all these god is conscience he is the searcher of hearts he transcends speech and reason he is personal god to those who need his personal presence he is embodied to those who need his touch like he could be krishna he could be radha if if you want somebody wants to preach them into a temple then they are personalized he is embodied to those who need his touch he is the purest essence he simply is to those who have faith if a person does not have the faith then for them the god does not exist he is in us and yet above and beyond us everybody can feel the presence of god yet he is beyond us he is ever forgiving for he always gives us the chance to repent in case a human being does a mistake he gets the chance to repent therefore he is forgiving god as a personal deity loves human so truth and ahimsa form a relation means to end is ahimsa which is love and compassion there is no place for ahimsa in god as love uh, gandhi's practice of ahimsa superpassed all boundaries of the self atman is experienced in every state of existence pure consciousness such as such as is withdrawn from all physical and sensual world gandhi makes a break with the belief that self realization was accomplished when one had withdrawn from the world so i mean the normal uh, uh, vedantin uh, and the normal uh, belief was that one has to uh, uh, to become a sadhu to to renounce the world and you have to withdraw from the world uh, he believes but then he gandhi is talking about the other way gandhi makes a break with the belief that self realization was accomplished when one has withdrawn from the world so for self realization but one need not really withdraw from the world this is the break from the uh, the, the shankar vedanta he believes that his realization was connected with that of others now here the whole concept of other comes the other means not me anything which is not me and the whole uh, the, the realization is uh, uh, to be able to connect with the other which is not me it is not simply withdrawing from the world and uh, 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 sort of putting yourself completely out of the world but it is to be connected with the others very similar to tagore's point of view this was perhaps the influence of buddhism and jainism now let me discuss briefly the gujarati vaishnavism as practiced by gandhi with some examples gandhi's emphasis was clearly on compassion and selfless service the idea of bonding and respecting every 
form of life on earth, celebrating their common foundation in God. As as you know, the world is created by God, so the foundation lies in the in, in God, and therefore every life on the earth has the foundation in God. With Gandhi and on his particular issue, Gandhi's sentiments would Gandhi, Hindu sentiments would have been only further strengthened by the Jain philosophy to which he was adequately exposed in early life. Uh, the, uh, Gandhi was very much exposed to Jainism right from his childhood, as we know from his biography. In October 1947, when he fell sick, he says, he says, within court, now the situation is staged. He's getting old, he's sick, so the situation is staged. And also, people don't listen to him so much. So now the situation is staged, but I am the same. I have no other medicine than the name of God. The only medicine, because he believed so much in so he realized he, he he could see God in himself. So for him, the only name of God can save him. That's the only medicine. No human medicine can save me. I am the same as I was. I still say the same things as I used to say when I was done. It's good that you still listen to me to my prayers with respect, and I do what I do by nature without any artificiality. So I'm not artificial. My Christian name. मैं जो कहता हूँ अपनी स्वभाव से कहता हूँ द इलनेस इज नेग्लिजिबल एंड ही सेज दैट वॉट एवर लिटल इलनेस आई हैव इज जस्ट नेग्लिजिबल इट्सली कफ इट विल डू इट्स वर्क एंड आई विल डू माइंड द इलनेस हैज इट्स ओन नेचर इट हैज इट्स ओन स्वभाव सो इट विल डू इट्स ओन वर्क एंड आई विल डू माइंड इधर द इलनेस विल डू इट्स वर्क एंड आई विल डाई इफ आई एम सिक and if the illness is doing its work then i will die it will either win or if i still have some work left to be done if my time is not complete if i still have some work to be done then it will keep me alive then illness cannot do anything to me and therefore it will keep me alive uh, but do I, uh, but do not forget ram now so only the name of ram has can save me is the only medicine so do not forget ram nam forget kaam krodh lobh and moh so all these things which are the cause of attachment forget them that is kama krodh lobh and moh but don't forget ram nam but if i get kaf while talking ram nam while taking ram nam when i'm taking ram nam and if i get cough because that's the illness i have then my purusharth would work my purusharth which i have sort of accumulated in the life and before that would work but just because i have cough i cannot forget ram nam i will continue my ram nam even when the cough is disrupting my ram nam now this is one incident from harijan the other one is from gandhi's past during 1945 was a new experience for him he says i got the opportunity to speak to millions of people i prepared people to listen to me tomorrow the nation may or may not remain so he thinks that this was uh, after during the for uh, the Uh, fast in 1945, and he sees a huge uh, number of people around him, millions of people around him, and he thinks that I'm fortunate that at least there are some people, uh, there are a lot of people to listen to me. But then, just by listening to to me may not be enough, and the nation may or may not remain. While praying, we all can purify ourselves. but what we can do is because the effect or the uh, the end of this whole uh, uh, fast against wild uh, against violence is not enough the result is not in our hands so what we can do is we can pray and we, by praying we can purify ourselves if you join the prayer then it will be good for me 
beneficial for Hindustan. My fast will go on. No one need to worry for me. The violence must die. There is nothing to be afraid of. Anyone who is born cannot be free of death. I have, since I have taken the vow to fast unto death, so if I am born, I am bound to be die to die. Therefore, let us pray and purify ourselves. By death, we can come out of various kinds of dukkhas. So the dukkhas which we have in our life, by praying and reaching to death, that is not something which is unexpected, because one is bound to die if I if one is born. So by death, we can come out of various kinds of dukkhas. So dukkhas will be overcome, and therefore we should not be scared of any death. But stick to the vow, stick to the truth which you have realized from inside, and therefore pray and purify yourself. In society, Gandhi witnessed the sorrows and agony of Hindu women due to abduction by Muslims. Women had to face social exclusion as Muslims abducted women and left them nowhere to go. Her own family and society saw her as untouchable and outcasted her, but this cannot be accepted. Has she gone from the society? Now, this is the question Gandhi is raising. That a woman, when she is abducted by the Muslims, she is left on the street and she has nowhere to go. Has she really gone from the society? His answer is no. This cannot happen. Has she left on her own will? We must ask. Has she, no, 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 no. she has not left on her own will because she was the Muslim. The women who lives on her own will, with her elite background, Vyavichari Mahila, the one who is Vyavichari and who lives with her own will, she lives comfortably. She lives comfortably with somebody with whom she has gone to live. And the one who got abducted, the one who is, has been abducted forcefully by somebody becomes a bad woman. So the one who goes, goes with, the, with her own will, she still remains a good woman uh, in the eyes of the society. But the, the one who has been forced to, uh, to, 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 to leave her house and uh, she has been abducted, she becomes a bad woman. Now this I can never accept. Now this is again an example that how much he was concerned about the, the women and the other uh, of the society. While talking of untouchability, now next example is about untouchability. Gandhi says, I want to uplift Hinduism. I regard the untouchables as an integral part of Hindu community. I am pained when I see a single bhangi driven out of the fold of Hinduism. Now you can see that all this voice is coming from inside his heart. I do not regard bhangis or super class harijan as in any sense a lower order. Traditionally in Hindu society, bhangis, the sweepers, or the, or the class who cleans the, 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 uh, in the society are considered as very low order. Uh, but Gandhi, uh, actually, he, uh, he was against uh, this uh, classification. And he considered bhangis also as human beings. And he, uh, he gave utmost uh, uh, respect to bhangis. On the contrary, I know many bhangis are worthy of reverence. This is what he argues. But at the same time, he also did not want bhangis to have any ill feeling for the upper caste people. Now, Gandhi also believed that in Hindu society, there is a classification, the four different classes. He did strongly believe that they, they are meant to be four different classes. But this discrimination, any work, uh, whether that is of cleaning or any work which is of uh, reading books, none of the work is higher of quality than the other one. I believe the doctrine of equality as taught by Lord Krishna in the Gita 
The Gita teaches us that members of all the four castes should be treated on equal basis. It, was, it does not pre prescribe the same dharma for the Brahmin as for the Bhangi. As you know, because of the four different classes, they have different dharmas. It is the duty of the Brahmin to see that untouchables do not feel despised or looked down. All have to be treated equally without any differential treatment. Anyone who worships the same God can keep his body and soul clean, demands respect. Now, this is extremely important that for him, cleaning the body by praying to God is more important than cleaning the, 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 the uh, and also the, the uh, cleaning of the soul, uh, that is more important than anything else. And therefore, anybody who does this demands respect. I would regard myself as a sinner if I gave unclean food from the left out from the kitchen. I remember even in our childhood, uh, we have to practice this because of the custom of the society, that the left out food will be given to the, uh, from the kitchen will be given to the sweeper. As a Vaishnava, I refuse to believe that anyone can be regarded untouchable by reason of his, his or her birth. Just because they are born in one particular family, therefore they are untouchable and therefore they are not regarded, they are not respected. This is something which should be, be rejected as Vaishnava. Just as we receive our mother from her sanitary service that she renders when we are infants and greater uh, and Greater her service, greater is a reference to her. Uh, similarly, the bhangis are entitled to our highest reverence for the sanity service they perform for the society. Just as we respect our mother, because she, during our infant time, has did all her sanitary service, and she uh, and she uh, uh, and like her, all the women of the house keep on giving the sanitary service of the in the house. Therefore, we give them respect. And the more sanitary service they give, we respect them more. And therefore, by the same logic, uh, uh, the Bhangis actually, they are entitled to the highest reference. And this is what he's arguing. Uh, 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 Tagore also believed in the same thing. As a Vaishnav, he says, in my clan, all the members do not interdine. Now, as I was saying that in my family too, I faced this kind of discrimination. Uh, uh, Gandhi also during his time saw this and he also had to go through with this uh, kind of uh, uh, social customs. As a Vaishnav, he says, in my clan, all the members do not interdine, like because of the caste system, uh, not everybody sits together to eat. In certain cases among our Vaishnav families, they do not use each other's utensils or even cook food on fire, fire fetched from other's kitchen. Even the fire which is fetched from other's kitchen, because earlier we didn't have the matchbox. People will, someone will, uh, 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 will fire and then, you know, some other people will get the fire, uh, fetch the fire and cook the food. And therefore, one could not even fetch the fire from a, a lower class family uh, and all this Systems, I mean, social customs were really strongly uh, ex uh, accepted. Uh, the esteem in which I hold Malviyaji, so he says that even in his family he saw this this kind of customs. This guy, he, did, he never accepted them, but he did see that this was going on. Now, not only this, he also says that the esteem in which I hold Malviyaji, Pandit Maha, uh, uh, Mother Mohan Malviya a very high caste Brahmin, the, the, the respect which he, uh, Gandhiji gave it to him, I will wash his feet. So he was a Brahmin, no doubt, but the esteem uh, kind of uh, uh, respect which he gave, he would wash his feet, but he would not take food touched by me. But because he's a high Brahmin, he would not take food touched by me, touched by Gandhi. Am I to resent it as a mark of contempt? So do I have to sort of resent it as mark of contempt? Certainly not, because I know that no contempt is met. So here, the heart, the voice of the heart is extremely important, which is trying to listen to. Maryada Dharma, 
So this is all what he calls it as Maryada Dharma. It's not essential part of Hinduism. This is all we, uh, we are calling them as social customs. But, uh, 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 he makes a distinction between the social customs and Maryada Dharma. And he says that these are not part of the Hinduism. But he also clearly states that his goal for removing untraceability by saying, I want to remove untraceability because its removal is essential for Swaraj. And I want Swaraj. So his a greater aim was Swaraj and not untouchability. So, and if by, untouch, by removing untouchability, he can get uh, uh, more and more people uh, who will join his movement and they will all be, they will all purify by uh, uh, worshipping uh, and we, will, we want Swaraj. But I would not exploit you for gaining any political end of mind. But at the same time, he also clarifies that uh, although my aim is to get Swaraj, but I would not exploit anybody by gaining this political end of mind. The issue with me is bigger than Swaraj. The Gita tells us that by sincerely meditating on him in one's heart, one can attain moksha. So if one is uh, 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 sincerely meditating in his, uh, on him, Whosoever it is, it could be Allah, it could be uh, Buddha, it could be Rama. But if one is sincerely meditating in, on him in one's heart, one can attain moksha. Meditation is waiting on God. Waiting on God means increasing purity. So when we are sort of waiting for God, then we are meditating. And meditating is, meditating is means that you are purifying your, in the process of purifying is going on. Let us by prayer purify ourselves and we shall not only remove untouchability, but also shed has, hasn't the advent of Swaraj. So by purifying ourselves, by purifying untouchability, by purifying most of the people in the world, others, we will hasten to advent to Swaraj. Now you can see that here, Swaraj is not simply independence. Swaraj is much, much more wider sense. If we become true follower of Rama or of anyone whom we truly believe, we can build our Hindustan good, a good Hindustan. If we get our Hindustan but do not follow Ahinsa. Now, Gandhi was really apprehensive that even if we get a Hindustan, but if we don't follow Ahinsa, which we can see now, we are not following, and only take Ramnam and do not follow the principle of Ahinsa. This is what we can see today, what is happening all around. If we take only Ramnam and do not follow the principle of Ahinsa, enjoy life with drinks and adultery, adultery, then such Hindustan, even after getting independence, would completely be destroyed. This is this was the apprehension of Gandhi, which you can see today, realized. While explaining the meaning of Ahinsa, Gandhi says, if someone comes to kill me, then also I would be able to pray that God should be kind to him. If someone is coming to kill me, I know that he's going to kill me, but let God give me so much strength that I should be able to say that God should be kind to him. I should be able to pray that God should be kind to him. If a person looks at me with frightening eyes to kill me, I should be able to look at him with peaceful eyes. When the, I know that the person is going to kill me, and I can see a blood in his eye, in his eye, still my prayer is that I should have peaceful eyes and heart as I consider my heart as a temple, because if I, I consider my heart as a temple, I should die by deciding Ram Nam. This is Ahinsa. And we know that this wish of Gandhi was fulfilled. Gandhi was extremely influenced by Vaishnavism, as we have already said. A Hetu Bhajan, written in 15th century by the poet Narsing Mehta, in Gujarati language, Vaishnav Janato Tene Kahiye Je Peer Parai Jani Re is 
was one of the most popular Hindu bhajan written in the 15th century by the poet Narsingh Mehta in Gujarati language. The bhajan was included in Mahatma Gandhi's daily prayer. Every day he used to sing this song. The bhajan speaks about the life, ideals, and mentality of a Vaishnav Jana, a follower of Hindu, of Indian soul, rightful path of life, experience, and practice the truth. You can enjoy the bhajan. Just give me a minute. We are going to play the bhajan. This bhajan says that one who is a Vaishnav, devotee of Vishnu, knows the pain of others, does good to others, without letting pride enter into his mind. Vaishnav tolerates and praises the entire world, does not speak ill of others, keeps his promises, actions, and thoughts pure. Your mother is blessed indeed.
One who is a Vaishnav or devotee of Vishnu knows the pain of others, does good to others without letting pride enter his mind. A Vaishnav tolerates and praises the entire world, does not speak ill of others, keeps his promises, actions and thoughts pure. Your mother is blessed indeed. A Vaishnav sees everything equally, rejects greed and avarice, respects women as he respects his own mother. Though his tongue may tire, he will utter no untruth. Never touches the property of others. Moho, Maya, Vyape nahi jane. Breathe Vairagya, Jena, Manme. Manmanari. They do not succumb to worldly attachments. They are firmly detached from the mundane, their entrance by the name of God. All places of pilgrimage are embodied in them. A Vaishnav does not succumb to worldly attachments. He has renounced lust of all types and anger. The poet Narsi will like to see such a person by whose virtue the whole family gets salvation. Uh, the second song which I would also like to play for you is which he which Gandhi used for almost every occasion that was Raghupati Raghav Raja Ram Pati Tapavan Sita Ram.
everyone as we all are your children we all request that this eternal wisdom of humankind prevail now 
here uh, there are some variations of this song which are also interesting i thought i should bring it to you uh, one line here is another song says mukh mein tulsi ghat mein ram jab bolo tab sita ram uh, another line which is also added haath haath se karo ghar ka kaam मुख से बोलो सीताराम लाइन ऑल्सो एडिट बंसी वाला है घनश्याम धनुष्यधारी सीताराम दीज आर ऑल इंटरेस्टिंग एडिशन टू दिस सॉन्ग विच आई थिंक शो दैट वॉट काइंड ऑफ प्योरिटी वन कैन थिंक ऑफ ब्रिंगिंग द मासस टूगेदर एंड द इनर काइंड ऑफ the realization of the god is uh, sort of expected from the people coming together and singing this song for priority and also following the actions in their own life while concluding i may say that i find this unique gandhian interpretations of indian philosophy philosophical systems so it is normally we think indian philosophical systems bound their own metaphysical and epistemological Uh, feelings and bound within their own uh, kind of boundaries but here we find uh, gandhi's uh, uh, thought which is across all the boundaries and putting all of them together and sort of working towards universal vedanta that includes shankhya jain system buddhist system and also yoga we find an interesting blending of vedanta which is orthodox yet reformed hinduism with unorthodox jainism and buddhism using ahimsa and anekantavad so ahimsa in the in the in the widest sense it is used here uh, used in buddhism basically and also in jainism but gandhi uses ahimsa in a very very different sense the same is about truth which is using and therefore crossing all the boundaries of all indian philosophical system gandhi built his own religious spot thank you so much for the presence uh, for for listening and patience and also providing me the opportunity thank you so much uh thank you madam for your uh, nice informative thought provoking as well as illuminating speech as i found from the chat box most of the audience are saying that it's a very nice uh one sashwata uh, bhattacharya he has one question for you his question is ma'am Yes. When Gandhi was young, he was greatly influenced by Western ideas. He wrote, he wore coat boot, even ate meat too. Later, when he came back to India from South Africa, he became devout Vaishnav, become spiritual. Can you say, please, what was the contribution of the ideas of Vaishnavism behind the rise of Gandhi? he changed and his search for truth on violence and love for all this is the question asked by shuddha satya bhattacharya a uh, shashwat bhattacharya shashwat bhattacharya okay thank you so much shashwat uh, well you are right that uh, uh, although his uh, sort of uh, foundation as a childhood in gujarat uh, huh? that that was transformed in the western world and he was completely a changed personality perhaps you also know a little bit about his how he went to uh, to uh, to the west and how he went to, to england and how he was uh, sort of learning uh, uh, having i mean continuing his education uh, but at the same time uh, his he also realized uh, uh, in the west gave him the wider perspective to see the limitations and uh, the limitations of our thought the, the limitations of our, our uh, uh, country uh, in the sense that uh, how the west looked at indians 
and uh, after realizing he literally turned back and uh, he started looking at his own foundation uh, and his uh, rationalism which was actually he imbibed from his family he uh, received from his tradition uh, he started working on that uh, and i'm sure it was already there it's not, nothing which actually sort of came from the west but it is it was simply a realization what he already had inside uh, his rationalism is actually uh, extensively have talked uh, in my lecture that how this rationalism uh, which is not a rationalism in the traditional sense it is not a uh, is a vedanta in the traditional sense and yet it is a, a kind of rational vedanta as I, i was trying to put it um, a combination of most sankhya uh, buddhism jainism yoga uh, and also some other systems he puts all of them together and he develops his own idea now this rationalism i mean he he did not really simply sort of worked on the philosophical ideas but he was speaking from his art he was practicing this from his art and this is what he used in his life as we can i was giving all the examples from his life and that is what i was trying to explain right. i will read some somewhat here thank you okay uh, so madam one more question from yes. one of your beloved and our also that is shivli kohar who is supposed to be the assistant professor uh, netaji anapak mahavidyalay she uh, want to ask you respected didi i want to know from you that what is the difference between shankara acharya and ramanuja acharya is gandhi called a real or true vaishnava uh, uh well uh, as i was saying that uh, uh, i mean this uh, shankara acharya is advaita vedanta in the strict sense and uh, ramanuja acharya is uh, like dvaita dvaita and there the, the difference between the maya i mean the world and the brahman uh that dvaita is advaita from one perspective and dvaita from other perspective and this is where gandhi actually constructs his vision he finds a place in ramanuja's vedanta uh, and he reinterprets in such a way that he puts rational i mean for example bhakti for example uh, sympathy uh, uh, karuna uh, daya maya mota all these things you know he can be put there sympathy for and the respect for others so this is the world which is equally real and in that sense uh, uh, the the vedanta uh, is reinterpreted by gandhi uh, putting vaishnav uh, concepts uh, including bhakti Uh, uh, in uh, in Ramanuja's first, uh, sort of system. Okay. So uh, uh, I think there might have some other questions, but due to uh, considering Madam's business and uh, time, we will not take a lot of uh, other question. So with this few uh, interaction and valuable speech by Madam, let us conclude our today's session. and as you know as instructed by agc mhrd visoharati university is very keen to showcase a webinar under the name gandhi week out of which we are just going to uh, arrange five different speech this out of two five different speech we have already completed second speech and today afternoon session from 3:30 pm onwards we will have one uh, more session which will be speak by uh, shrimati harsha tiwari a research scholar from uh, department of economics and politics and uh, concerned link has been sent to all the participants please find in your mail and let me uh, just welcome you for the third session and let me extend my deep regards for the th- for the uh, uh, your patience for listening in the second session uh, i think we all will uh, come together through web by 3:30 pm here and we will Uh, listen our research scholar beloved research scholars shrimati harsha tiwari and uh, let us now conclude our second speech and i am really very happy and would like to extend our deep sense of regards to our uh, registrar madam uh, head department of philosophy and comparative religion who supposed to be none other than professor asha mukherjee and in santiniketan our beloved asha ji and uh, 
I am really grateful to her because of his tight schedule. In one way, she is a HOD. Another way, she is a, actually registered at the university and academician too. So in spite of her busy, busy schedule, she just takes three, four days back to confirm his, uh, her, uh, this kind of invitation. And uh, with her thought-provoking speech, we think we all are encouraged a lot. And I'm really thankful, ma'am, for your nice uh, presentation. And I think even after your superannuation, if we call you, I think you will come and enlighten us with your monk of experience, sea of experience. And with these few words, please accept our humble regards to you. Uh, and with this, let me extend my deep regards to all the learned audience who are spared time and patience for listening and uh, extending necessary support for arranging this session. So thank you all. Have a good noon. Have a nice lunch session by your own position. And let us come back by 3.30 PM. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's really my pleasure. Yeah.